Hey everybody, this is Bad at Keeping Secrets. I'm Carissa. This is Susan Weiss Bolin. Um, and we are talking today about seasonal self-care rituals. Um, and I wanted to just give you Susan a quick introduction, but I'm gonna have you expand on it. Um okay. the I think, well, I should say I was really drawn to your work. Um, or actually I picked this up in a bookstore, um, which normally uh I don't know how I find people. I guess I think people find me in a weird way, or like sometimes you just something, some magic happens. You like um, pick something up that you, you needed, but you didn't know that you needed in that moment. But I picked up seasonal self-care rituals um, in a store in Oakland. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, I need this now. Um, and I think it was as a sort of like, where it hit a nerve with me is the idea that like trying to find attunement with nature and having meaningful rituals in a sort of secular society, especially in <clears throat> California, there's not, there's not such a strong, just, there are seasons, but like there aren't, I, there's something like deep inside of me that's <laughs> longing um, to kind of feel better and to also um, spend time and appreciate nature. Uh, and I was really excited about the theories in here, but I want, I want you to maybe talk a little bit about, um, your background. This is your second book. Um, your first one was Ayurveda for Be a beginner's guide, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and right there, <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 I artfully placed my books behind me. <laughs> oh no, I really appreciate that. Uh, okay. that kind of like a cheat for me. <laughs> um, but if you could talk a little bit, maybe let's start with people for, cause I actually didn't know anything about Ayurveda before, um, picking up your book and then falling in love. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. So, um, about Ayurveda, and then I can tell you about me, whatever you want to know. Ayurveda is a 5,000 year old system of medicine from India. It literally means science of life. And it uh, it was the first medical system that was ever created. So in, in India, pre-colonial times, five, six, maybe even 10,000 years ago, it was the type of medicine um, that the whole you know region followed. And they saw people as very individual, types there were we call them the doshas d-o-s-h-a in sanskrit and some so some people are considered more sort of like airy spacey um they're kind of like um a little bit um, thinner they're drier skin dry hair um they're the people that we call vata dosha v-a-t-a and they're comprised of um space and air so they run a little cold and a little dry and they move very fast, like the wind, because of all that air and space. And then the great, we call them rishis in Sanskrit. Rishi means seer. So then these rishis or these vaija, these Ayurvedic doctors, also saw that some people were very hot and fiery. They're very like quick to make a decision. They're um, great leaders. They're great conversationalists. They, um, they also run very hot, which can make them impatient, frustrated, maybe a little bit angry. So they're those kind of people that have this buildup of heat inside their body and they're called pitta dosha, P-I-T-T-A. And then the third type of individual that the rishis and the doctor saw was somebody who is comprised more of earth and water. And that is called kapha dosha, K-A-P-H-A. -A. And kapha dosha with that, those elements of earth and water is a little more steady, stable, grounded, a little bit more a little heavier than the other doshas. So Pitta, who's made of fire and water, they have a great metabolism. So they have a really strong build. And um, I'm sorry, I have a lot of sunlight coming in here right now. <laughs> I'm trying to, <laughs> whatever. It's the elements, that's where we are. And so um, Kapha dosha with that heaviness of the earth and the water, um, they just become like the foundation for the other doshas. And so that's what these great teachers saw that people were very individual. So they had to treat them individually. So somebody who was more air and space and that dryness and that cold, maybe they needed food um, that was going to ground them more, heavier food, soups and stews, beans and so on to um, sort of keep them steady and stable and keep the mind focused by um, having those good meals every day, good oils like ghee, spices, and of course, like turmeric, cumin, and coriander to keep the person nourished. 
And then for the person Pitta, who's made of fire and water, they needed more cooling foods, things like uh, coconut water, ghee is also cooling, cucumbers, um, cooling spices like fennel. And the kapha dosha, the one made of earth and water, needs to lighten up a little bit. So they're more drying foods. They're also cold dosha, so warming foods as well, but more um, fruits and vegetables and not like the really heavy grains and, um, and uh, uh, other, you know, meats and so on that are better for the later dosha. So it's just interesting that they saw people were like that. Some people airy and spacey, some people hot and fiery, and some people really earthy. And I think we can all see ourselves in that, or at least somebody we know. I, in my books, I go very much into detail about the doshas and give dosha quizzes so somebody can get a guideline. It's best, you know, to have an Ayurvedic practitioner to help you. But you can get um, an idea of who you are and maybe where your balances and imbalances are. Because if you have too much fire, you need to cool down. Too much earth and water, you need to lighten up, et cetera. So Ayurveda is a science of opposites. If you're too heavy, you need to be light. If you're too light, you need to be a little bit heavier. It's like that. And that's how we work with the seasons as well, which I know we're going to get into also. Uh, can you talk, so I think it's like, for me, I, I see these sort of like systems and classifications as a really interesting way is to understand sense of self. And I think for me, this was some something since I had never heard of it. Um, it felt... It felt at the same time being entirely new, but also felt like um, there was a certain, like I could get behind the logic of, of wanting yeah. balance and finding opposites for balance, if that makes sense. Can you talk, yeah. about, how did you kind of come about be, how were you personally introduced to the practice? So I had a bookstore in Baltimore called Breathe Books for um, uh, quite a, a decade or so. And when I opened the bookstore in 2004, I had an Ayurvedic section, but I really didn't know that much about Ayurveda. I'd sort of in the back of my mind been enamored with India, like, I want to go to India. I, I lived in Israel for a very long time in my 20s and 30s. And a lot of people in Israel, when they finish the army, they go to India. And then they come back and they bring all this cool stuff like yoga and Hindu practices and things like that. And so when I lived in Israel, I used to take yoga and, you know, learned a little bit of like Sanskrit and stuff from from these people that had come back. And I was, you know, a very impressionable 20 some year old that led me to Buddhist meditation. And that led to other things along the way. But I always had this idea of India in the back of my mind. <clears throat> well, after I opened my bookstore, I think it, I opened the bookstore in 2004 and it was 2007 that I really started to pay more attention to my Ayurveda section in the bookstore. Um, personally, I have, I had like a, a weight and food issue forever. And um, at one point in my life, I even weighed 240 pounds. And at that point I weighed about 220 when I had the bookshop. I'm five, seven. So I'd like to say I carried it well, but I still had this extra weight that I knew didn't feel good. And I thought maybe Ayurveda had something in there for me that could help me, you know, just get rid of this forever because I went through, you know, years of doing all that stuff like Weight Watchers and bulimia doesn't work all that I mean you know like all the, I went through all sorts of restriction and all that crazy shit that women put them I know men do too but a lot of women put themselves through this and oh the damage it's terrible and so I at some point I just gave up and said I'm just going to be my weight but I knew I really wasn't that weight it just didn't feel right and so I decided to, um, I took a dosha quiz in one of my books and I started reading about Ayurveda and it made a lot of sense to me. So like you, Carissa, are, you fit mostly what I can see from your writing and your artwork into the category of vata dosha. Um, vata is very creative and sort of going from one thing to another, like every shiny new object kind of like distracts them. And, or they just, they just excel at each, like, I want to try that. I want to do that. So, you know, looking at your books and your work and your writing, I see you just go from one thing to another and your 
you dive in deep and you're great at it. And so that's a very Vata um, type of person. Myself, I was more Kafic, which is, um, well, I'd say I'm more Kafic. It's, a, you know, that's this sort earth. of like heavy earthy yeah an earthy person so like I even remember like in high school they used to call me earth mama and stuff like that and I always had this like huge hair and I don't know just very I don't know just like that big boobs big hips like I was always that person um but I also like to travel a lot and I lived overseas and and it's weird. Like we're all a bunch of different doshas. We have a bunch of different dosha qualities, but I'm primarily kapha. You're primarily vata. And so the kapha was keeping all the weight on me. So I, I mean, long story short, I decided to go to the Chopra Center in California for Panchakarma, which is Ayurvedic detox. Um, <clears throat> I looked into going to India at the time, but the season and the timing wasn't right. So I did go to California to the Chopra Center. And I did have this cleanse, this 10 day program I went through. And it just, it literally, it really did change my life. It was just completely life changing to understand the doshas, to see where I had been out of balance, to see how easily I could get myself back into balance by making different food choices. For instance, thinking like eating a raw salad every day with like tomatoes and cucumbers and lettuce, like we all think that's really good for us, but it's not, <laughs> it's really not good for anybody. Um, so when I, because that raw food is very hard to digest and it can also leave you feeling hungry because some people are not able to extract all the nutrients from the food and eating a cold salad in December is a terrible idea because your body's trying to stay warm and you're putting more cold in it. So by, by the things I learned in Ayurveda to cook my food and eat this kind of bean and that kind of green and how tomatoes are too sour for my body and cucumbers are too watery for my body. Like I cut all that out and I very quickly lost weight. I lost 50 pounds. I lost 80 points on my cholesterol and it has stayed off all these years and years now, years. I mean, and that doesn't happen for a lot of people. So, it, and going through menopause with that, I mean, it's like, and COVID and I mean, it's like, it's amazing. So you learn how to, um, Treat your imbalances through food, lifestyle, breath work, yoga, meditation. I love the chakra system that's part of Ayurveda, you know, and sort of energetic medicine too. So you learn how to create balance in yourself. So once I saw, you know, the changes in myself, I decided to become an Ayurveda. You could say I have a lot of pitta dosha because I was like, I'm doing it. And I did it a hundred percent. Then I'm going to get certified in it because this is amazing. And then I went and I got on all these certifications in Israel, Israel, India and, and the U S and, you know, then I just became an Ayurvedic practitioner. I closed my bookstore in 2014. I closed the bookstore and then I got a call from a company to write a book. I thought it was a scam, but it wasn't. Turns out this book here, Ayurveda beginner's guide is now in like seven or eight languages sold probably 50, 60,000 copies. And then I got the, the next book deal, the one that you found um, from Simon and Schuster. And they really just, I mean, it's some, they really just let you write from your heart. I had a fantastic editor there. It was very encouraging. And then I have a new book coming out in the springtime of Ayurvedic remedies. So this has not only become like my lifestyle, it's my vocation as well. And um, yeah, I, I love it. And I love seeing how I can help people find their path to healing. Yeah. I think, I think it's interesting. Every time I was wondering if I could ask your opinion on something, every time I write about diet or not, because I feel like the term diet itself is very fraught at the moment or like mm -hmm. changing. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what, what diet means to, cause it's not, I don't get the sense that you're trying to advocate for losing weight necessarily. No. It's, um, right. so you maybe talk a little bit about what, what it means. Can you expand upon what it means to you, um, to make these lifestyle choices? Yeah, it's, um, means a lot. <laughs> I just, you know, it just made me, you just made me think of something, like, it's not about losing weight. I mean, it is, but it isn't if you need to. Some people need to gain weight. It's like finding your perfect weight. But there was a, 
you know, a time in my life, of course, when I was really heavy and I would walk through like a crowded place, like let's say like a restaurant and I would have to like turn my hips so I could pass through the chairs and tables, you know, or like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Cause there wasn't enough room or like on an airplane or something. And it was embarrassing and it just didn't feel right that I couldn't like move as myself. And then when I did lose the weight and one day I was walking through a crowded restaurant and I realized I didn't have to like turn to shimmy through like chairs and tables, I could just walk straight. I like was, wow, I, that's me. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do like normal weight or something like that. It was just like me. Like, I don't have to like try to make my way through places anymore. I can drop all that, just mm-hmm. drop all that shit already. You know, it's like followed me for 40 years. Okay. Well, maybe like 20 of those 40 years, but it's like, I can just, I don't have to think about that anymore. I can move on. And that was, I mean, Honestly, it kind of makes me choke up. I don't talk about it that much because I don't think about it that much anymore. But I was just able to move on from thinking about my weight and thinking about food all the time. And when I was bulimic in my 20s, thinking about driving to that fast food restaurant and that one, are they going to know me? How much money am I spending drinking enough water so I could throw it up? I mean, that horrible, damaging stuff that takes over your brain for what, you know? So Ayurveda helped me become so balanced in mind and body that I didn't have to think about that anymore. So my mind just exploded in this like fabulous person inside that was being covered by 50 pounds of emotions, not just 50 pounds of body, covering my heart, covering my mind. You know, it's not, the irony is not lost on me that after I lost the weight, I just started making all these, like getting rid of all those size 22 clothes and throwing away all this stuff in my house and cleaning out the bedside tables, just like making room for something I didn't know what. And then it is just like this little Ayurvedic fairy tale. My husband walked into the bookstore. He wasn't my husband yet. It was this guy named Larry. He walked into the bookstore and then I married him. I mean, so it's like, he just like appeared, you know, 13 years ago and I was ready. Nothing to do with the weight, just letting go of all that stuff that was covering me. And I was not, I wasn't allowing myself to see and feel because I was wasting so much time thinking about the food and my size and what am I going to do about it? And then that washed, there's more to it, but that washed away. And I was able to look at the bigger world and expand my mind and myself and my heart and just see that there was a lot, there were things that were much more important than my hips (laughs) in the world. You know, it almost makes you like the opposite of selfish. (laughs) It makes you like more altruistic when you just let go of just focusing on yourself all the time. And suddenly you can look at the big world around you. Does that make sense? Yeah, it also really is. It's it's wonderful to think that since I don't know if I have that sort of same understanding or resonance with systems of meaning that feel reliable and true. Um, Hmm. And when I say that, it, I mean, like, I think that the, the story I'm telling myself doesn't really have a logical, not that yours has a logical, that I I feel like I want to believe that if I believe certain things that there's a, a greater force or like forces that I don't understand at play that are sort of, will make other things fall in line. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I am, I'm very at an uncertain sort of juncture um, in my mm-hmm. life. I was wondering, so a question that I normally start out um, by asking people that I didn't ask you was kind of uh, what it was like growing up and what kind of your parents were and what your exposure to sort of these sort of theories or um, your bookshop was a new age bookshop store, yes. right? Um, yeah. Kind of how, what, what your exposure to this sort of alternative um, ways of thinking. 
Oh, yeah. So I grew up in a, um, well, my dad was a refugee from the Holocaust and um, came to America with his parents when he, in the, um, in the late thirties and they moved, they were in New York. So you have that first generation American um, refugee from the Holocaust. That was like amazing on that side. And my mother was a German Jew, but from Baltimore. <laughs> so those two types of German Jews don't really go together very well, I have to say. So it was not like sort of like country club German Jew. And then we got to get out of this country before we're killed German Jew and uh, got together. <laughs> and it um, <clears throat> made for a very interesting uh, family life, um, grandparents and so on. But it was very traditional. Um, not religious Jewish, but you know, very Jewish, lived in a Jewish neighborhood, went to a Jewish school. I mean, everyone was Jewish at my school. It wasn't a Jewish school, but they were all Jewish. And um, I actually didn't even know non-Jews existed. Mm -hmm. Everybody was Jewish in my world. And um, except for a housekeeper who came from another part of town. So there was this area I knew where there were non-Jews. So that was weird, right? That was like weird. And we always had a Christmas tree, which was also weird. And everybody in the neighborhood came to see the Christmas tree because we're very assimilated Jews. But there was no, there was no, nothing mystical, nothing. Um, I don't know. My, I had two older sisters. They were five and six years older than me. And what I learned from a therapist um, a few years ago was being raised with sisters that much older made me kind of like an only child. Mm -hmm because they were in junior high and high school and out of the house when I was still growing up. Um, but what, what happened when I, when I was 13 years old in 1976, I had an accident where I fell through a shower door. I fell through a glass shower door and I um, severed my left arm almost completely off. And the whole left side of my body went through the plate glass. And so there were a ma massive amount of blood loss and broken bones and you know, severed nerves and everything. And so what happened was I had a near death experience <clears throat> and it was uh, July 8th, 1976. And when I hit the glass, I was sort of thrown out of my body. I didn't know anything about near death experiences at the time. I mean, what 13 year old does, but I, I had, so I had that whole sort of typical experience of being above and seeing what was happening my mother running in, my sister running in, and they were all panicked. And I was up in this beautiful, like Garden of Eden space, talking to the powers that be saying, hmm, what's going to happen now? Am I, am I going to lose my arm if I go back? Should I go back? Should I stay here? This is really nice. Like having a whole big nonverbal conversation with, I have no idea who, I don't know what that was, but it was nice. <laughs> and eventually um, they said, look, you have to make a choice now. You either stay here or you're gonna go back in your body and we'll work out the rest. And I saw my mom and my sisters and I, and I felt that I could actually be, I felt calmer than they were, right? This was before 911. My mother's like calling the operator and neighbors and like, there's no emergency hotline to call, you know? And so I, I decided, I was like, this is great, wonderful to know you, but I think I'm gonna go back into my body and help them figure this out. And that's what I did. And there's like this moment where I made that decision and you're just like slammed back into your physical body. And I see blood going everywhere. And, and I'm not even sure I'm really gonna live and <clears throat> just trying to help my mother and my sister by saying like, I'm here, I'm okay, put towels, da, da, da. Paramedics came and wrapped me to a board because my ribs had come out my back and they thought my back was broken and all this pressurized stuff. And, and I'm telling the paramedics, I'm like, you know, I came back. I was, I saw you coming. There was a helicopter that came to take me to the Baltimore shock trauma. I, I saw that helicopter circling we lived on a, a next to a golf course. So I saw them circling the golf course and I was telling the paramedics everything. And my mother and sister were like, what is going on? Like, where, 
what nobody knew about near death stuff in 1976. Elizabeth Kubler Ross had written a book, <laughs> but uh, on death and dying, but we didn't have it in my house. Like we didn't know that yet. Um, and the paramedics, though, they were like, we hear this all the time. Don't worry. We this is normal. She had an experience. It's okay. And then I couldn't stop talking about the experience when I got to the hospital. I was telling them and so on. And so that, and nobody ever doubted me, which was really cool. No one ever said, there's no way that happened to you. Everybody was like, what the fuck happened? You know, it's like, that's amazing. And so I got confirmation that this did happen to me, that I had a near death experience and I made a choice to come back. And it made my little 13 year old world enormous. I started to realize at that point that the world was just so much bigger than I, I will ever understand. And I was also given this second chance at life. And I was also told when I was in that other place that nothing bad is ever going to happen to me again. They assured me that I will never hurt myself again. I will never have another accident, never have another scar. And so I, I came back with this fearlessness that nothing bad is ever going to happen to me again. Of course, I forgot that along the way, but there were times when I didn't forget it. Like, like I really thought I was um, indestructible. And so like in high school in the 80s, cocaine quaaludes boys like the whole thing like i'm indestructible alcohol i can do whatever i want and then there came a point where like eh, it's not such a good idea you know and then like the food and everything i, I can do whatever i want but like you have to get a hold on yourself but there's always in the back of my mind this accident i have scars all over my body you know this happened to me i was given this other chance I went through puberty and like crazy times, but now let's use these forces for good. And um, so that completely changed my mind. Um, I think it's- That's I what think, happened. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, as someone, I I had one, I would say near death experience and it, it's not dissimilar to yours. It was mm. less, less dramatic, I think, cause I just like fainted and fell on a, on a concrete stair. But I remember that there's a, like a really weird moment of calm or like, uh, and peace uh, that I felt like was just very much um, life-changing. I want to go back a little bit to the, because we don't have, um, the, I want, I really want to talk about seasonal self-care um, uh, rituals and what we can do in the fall and winter. But first, okay. to kind of give us some grounding on it, um, can we talk a little bit about food and mood? Sure. Yeah. Oh, my God. Uh, so there in my first book, I um, I wrote a lot about food and emotions and mood, can which is something like I, a, yeah, I, yeah. I fascinating. Something I learned from one of my mentors, my great, great teacher and wonderful friend, Amadea Morningstar, who wrote the book, The Ayurveda Cookbook, Ayurveda Cooking for Westerners. And she has a beautiful um, healing drinks book out now and is a polarity yoga teacher. She wrote about it in her first cookbook. And I was like, wow, this is something I really see with my clients a lot. So people who are attracted, what I saw, was the people who are attracted to certain kinds of food <clears throat> might be like craving, let's just say people who are craving sweets, right? Because that's a very common one. People who crave sweets um, are often not getting enough sweetness in their life. So they go to the food. There's a term in Sanskrit, the word is rasa, R-A-S-A. -A. Rasa has many meanings, but one of the meanings is um, emotion and another meaning is taste. So there's no such thing as non-emotional eating. Your taste affects your mood and what you're craving has to do with your mood. So you're craving sweets all the time. It could be that you are just simply not giving enough sweetness and love to others or accepting from people sweetness. You know, there's people that just rebuff it or they just hold themselves really tight. And there are people that you would say, use a word like, oh my God, that person is so bitter. And that person might also be craving bitter food, like eating leafy greens or um, pungent food, like different types of 
um, fruits or vegetables and um, spices that create uh, pungency, peppers and so on. And that person might be a person that's really nasty because they have so much heat that they're taking in and but they feel nasty and then they eat more and it makes it it just creates like a self-fulfilling prophecy and creates more of that. And so we try to look at what's going on. Like if I'm craving like really salty food, like what is going on with my mood? What sort of emotions am I feeling? I might be feeling, you know, we have like this term, like it's an old fashioned term, but oh, he's a salty sailor because he says whatever's on his mind and so on. Maybe I'm not saying what's on my mind. Maybe I'm using the food to stuff it down without expressing myself. And so there's uh, correlations to sweet, sour, salty, bitter, pungent, and astringent in the book. They are connected to the doshas and they're connected to emotions and they're foods for each of those tastes. And so that gets a little bit, you know, it, it detailed, but um, we, it just can reveal a lot about yourself uh, and what you're going through at any given time when you really can see the type of food that you're needing so that's um that's sort of like a snapshot of food and mood it's also really great to be able to I think take a moment like even if you are if you are like for example craving sweets or married to someone who craves wine um and to think yeah. about like to just kind of pause take that moment and think about like why this is or what what other what is what sort of need is this filling and I think that this is an interesting lens to think about that within yeah um and I think like for for all of us sort of I, I mean I guess this falls under the sort of mindful practice that also goes in but I never thought about I mean it's pretty obvious that like we use a lot of taste um, sensorial terms when we're describing people's personalities and um there's a sort of literalness that I find that that I find interesting um that also sort of maybe just is so deeply ingrained in my my culture that I've never paid too much attention to it mm -hmm. um so I think you touched on this earlier about sort of seasonal what you so like I think on the back of the book you talk about how in Ayurveda which I want to say correctly but I'm having a difficult you time. did you're correct I yeah Ayurveda Ayurveda. Close enough. Yeah. Um, all ailments begin <clears throat> at the junction of the seasons. Can you kind of unpack unpack what mm -hmm. that means or how the ailments yeah. come from uh the sort of moments of transition seasonally? Yeah, I think a lot of people see that, like they would get a cold like just before we're going into winter, or they have seasonal allergies as we're going into springtime. I mean, we Absolutely. see that. Yeah. So it seems like the body has a weakness between seasons and What's really important is to keep up with it. So let me do winter to spring because that's a really good one, <clears throat> even though that's not where we are right now. But remember it <laughs> for winter to spring. <clears throat> In winter, we eat heavier foods. We have greater appetite. Um, our digestive fires are called Agni in Sanskrit. So our Agni is burning really bright to keep the body warm. And that burns calories and that makes us want to eat more food. So we eat heavier, heartier food in the winter time to keep our bodies, um, to keep our bodies warm and to keep those digestive fires burning bright. And we can digest it really well during that time. We can digest heavier foods better. So like root vegetables, like we think about what happens in the winter, maybe not in Oakland, California, but in Baltimore, Maryland, it's very seasonal. So we have, you know, like uh, turnips and beets and sweet potatoes, and we have some carrots and so on, like all the root vegetables. And then there's also winter greens like kale and chard and so on that come out. Um, and so these are foods that are, we stew, we roast, we make soups to, to keep us functioning and warm during the winter. But it's heavy. And, um, you know, we might eat more bread and cheese and so on. Those are heavy foods that once winter is over, 
they are sticky in our body. We call that sticky substance AMA, A-M-A. So there's like a sort of sticky residue that stays with us is when we no longer need those heavy foods and things are starting to warm up and we have it's earthier. I mean, here we have rain and cold days and hot days and stuff as we move into spring it's, and everything is sprouting from the earth. So something different is happening from those like dark, cold, quiet days of winter. And so we have all this heavy food inside of us that was really needed in winter, but now we need to look to releasing that in the springtime because we're lightening up. We're beginning to lighten up in springtime. And then lo and behold, mother nature gives us these things like, um, you know, the greens start to infer like dandelion greens and, um, mustard greens and all, all sorts of ramps and you know all sorts of things start to come up out of the ground that counterbalance the winter food that start to scrape away all that gunk all that ama that is inside of us that helps us get ready um for springtime if we don't do that if we don't get rid of all that excess gunk and for lack of a better word we are going to suffer perhaps from seasonal allergies from colds from flu because our body is too heavy to go into the springtime mm. and we haven't taken that time to clean out. So I, I often recommend like a little mini cleanse between seasons. The so same in springtime to summer, we need to have cooler foods as we move in. Um, and then from summertime to fall, fall is tr starting to get dry and cold. And summertime, we were doing these things that were cooling. So we have to start to make that transition to more warming foods and more substantive and like lubricating foods. Um, so like I recommend just like in the springtime as we go into spring, March, April, doing perhaps a, a juice cleanse. I don't do any kind of fasting really, but maybe it's like starting out your day with like cilantro celery juice, you know? to just uh, maybe with a little bit of um, beet, even though beet is a root vegetable, but it cleanses the blood. It helps to get the gunk out of the liver and the other organs where things have built up. <clears throat> so maybe just, you know, having juice in the morning and not eating again until you're hungry is what I prescribe for my clients. Um, just doing that for like a week, you know, as we're in that transition phase and then moving strictly into spring food which is going to be much lighter than your winter food. And then we, the natural flavonoids um, that come in the plants and everything that we start to eat in the spring, they help us with a seasonal allergies. And so when we're eating properly for this season, the gut microbiome changes, the bacteria in the gut changes to help protect us from the assaults of the season, let's say. And so we need to make that shift so that we keep the body running smoothly. We keep the immune system boosted as you move from season to season. So like you don't eat oatmeal, you can maybe eat oatmeal every morning in the winter, but don't continue eating oatmeal every morning in the spring. You need something lighter, you know, at that time and, and something cooler as we move into summer. So that, that's kind of like a, a little primer. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I'm going to ask you, my next question that I really want to ask you is about how I think in this moment, or at least maybe I'm just speaking for me, I feel very overwhelmed and um, with the amount of information and the things I want to try and the things I want to do. And what I've learned about yeah. myself in the past couple of years is that if it's not either like bundled with something good, like some sort of, um, like for example, exercising and watching, allowing myself to like watch reality TV or something has to be very easy or like mm -hmm. I have to make it easy. Do you mm -hmm. have like a sort of easy way mm -hmm. that you tell people like if they want to try just like dipping their toe? Absolutely. It should all be easy. I never want to make anybody transition a hundred percent into anything and throw everything away in their kitchen and sit down to do a half hour of meditation every day when you've never done it before. Like, no, everything is baby steps and it's all about your lifestyle and what makes you feel good. I love that you love to watch reality TV and exercise. It's like, Phenomenal. I remember once after a retreat with Amadea Morningstar, we were sitting at my house after like 20 people left. And she said, do you have like People Magazine or Vanity Fair or something? Like, you know, we have to do things that, that feed us in a different way. So the, I think the ultimate self-care is knowing what you need. 
it's not what a million websites tell you and other people tell you and what they tell you to do at the spa or at Weight Watchers or whatever. It's about what you feel you need. So when we get, we might do a little cleanse when I begin with the client, maybe a kitchery cleanse. Kitchery is a Ayurvedic dish of split yellow mung beans, basmati rice, ghee, spices, and vegetables. Both of my books have the recipes. You can find recipes for kitchery everywhere. So maybe doing a little cleanse just to begin with for a day or two of eating a kitchery mono diet. Then your mind starts to clear up. Like the fogginess and the overwhelmingness that you just talked about. We start to get a little bit clearer and then we can make better decisions. And then we can say, what do I really want? What is it that I want? Who am I? What, what, what's my purpose? Why am I here? Like we start to be, get more clear and we start to become more focused on what's going to make us feel good. So it's just, it's very slowly going into it. And then we see like, oh, you know, I really don't feel good when I eat McDonald's for lunch every day. I get this coating in my mouth and I don't feel satisfied. And it's just, it makes, I'm hungry afterwards. And because McDonald's, I'll just say, it's just fast food. It's just sweet, sour, salty. We need to have bitter, pungent, astringent in our diet too, to make us feel like we're satisfied. So you start to see that. Hmm, maybe if I make a stew and I throw in a lot of greens or I, a handful of beans, I'm going to feel better. And it's really simple. Maybe if I start having ginger tea instead of coffee in the morning, maybe if I stop drinking cold drinks, because cold drinks in the winter, it's ridiculous. Cold drinks anytime puts out our digestive fires, but we don't, you know, our, our food doesn't metabolize as well. So maybe, you know, I talk to my clients, maybe just like, Stop with all the ice in your drinks. Let's start to have room temperature, or even warm water in the morning when we get up. Just even like that, like for three weeks, have some hot water with lemon in the morning. Let's not talk about anything else and let's see how you feel. These little rituals that we start to put into our life, we can say, wow, you know, I did that intentionally. I made hot water and lemon this morning intentionally and sat down and drank that. And I felt better than when I have a cup of coffee. So just noticing, being aware and being, um, you know, not like being like, like you have to do it this way, like very rigid, but like, oh, let me try this. She suggested I do this. Let me just try that for a minute and see how that feels. I want people to be very flexible with their lifestyle and to begin to notice what's right for them. Because what is right for you, Carissa, is not right for me. And it's not right for anybody else but you. So I, I sort of just lead you along a path to find your way. What is the Carissa way of balancing your vata? And then we, we start to look into that with food lists and food combinations and things like that, but not overwhelming. Just try to keep it simple. And then, you know, we go deeper into like doing oil body massages and taking herbs and supplements if needed. But yeah, I don't want to uh, overwhelm you. Can you, can you maybe, can we go back to just a couple of things? Like if you could give a general recommendation for the transition of the season that we're in right now. Sure. There's a lot of like destabling things going on. Um, right now. And I, I, I really appreciate your definition of self-care being knowing what your needs are. Mm -hmm. um, I never thought about it that way, but it, it feels um, at times the needs that I wrestle with having the needs that I have and knowing what they are all the time. Cause I, I want to just like consistently improve and change my personality to fit what I oh. feel like other people's needs are. I try to be aware of it. Um, and not necessarily because it totally putting one sort of stuffing things is not helpful either, but also, mm -hmm. I mean, it's always a balancing act. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I was just, um, I wanted to say that I appreciated that, um, self-care, uh, definition, but I wanted, um, yeah, if you could kind of give us a, give us some things right now that might be helpful to people <clears throat> or that you're finding with the people that you work with, people are needing right now. 
Yeah, so as we, we have transitioned from fall to winter, and so we're seeing that the, in the fall, everything dries up, the leaves dry and they fall off the trees and it gets colder out. And, and in the winter, like we can also, we can get um, rain and snow that make the earth very heavy. So we move sort of from this drying and light of leaves flowing through the air to this like heavy, stagnant, quiet, dark place right like here it gets dark at like 4 30 quarter of five now and so we want to honor that and we want to honor it in our body so how do we make that transition so we want to so personally i i like to have about two meals a day so we want to look and see what's right for you so just think about it when you wake up in the morning are you hungry or are you just thirsty like what's going on with you so for me personally, I wake up around seven. I'm not hungry till 10 or 11. And 10 or 11 is a great time to have your largest meal of the day. For anybody, even if you have breakfast, between sometime between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., having your largest meal of the day, because that's when we need food to keep get us through the rest of the day. A meal is two handfuls of food, which is two thirds of your stomach which leaves one third open for your digestive fires to break down the food. In Buddhism, they say you leave one third open for the Dharma, for the Buddhist teachings. And in Japanese, they say Hari Hachibu, which means eat 80% and leave 20% open. So we two handfuls is a great guideline. Largest meal of the day, noon, 12, I'm sorry, 10 to 2. And because it's winter, we want that meal to not, as I said, be a, a raw salad or something cold or just a sandwich or <clears throat> God forbid, like a cup of yogurt or something. Like we need this to be a substantial meal. So if you think about your grandparents or maybe if you grew up on a farm, like they really knew how to do things. <laughs> like, you know, so you have a meal that is warm. Maybe you make uh, vegetables and pasta or maybe you make a soup or you have um, fish and greens uh, stewed greens sauteed greens or something like that so something that where you have a nice combination of fats carbs protein and fiber we want to make sure like we eat a lot of beans and so you know having half a cup of beans sauteed with some greens or something like that and maybe over a bowl of rice or quinoa or millet you have this beautiful winter meal that's going to help you stay grounded and warm while it's cold and heavy outside so like a meal like beans and greens over grains is not heavy that's not going to weigh you down, but it's going to give you everything you need to sustain you throughout the day, the fiber and the fat, stir in a little ghee or olive oil and so on. And then we don't snack in between meals like that meal should take you through to dinner or supper, which you should eat at least three hours before bed. And of course, in wintertime, again, in this transition time, doing soup, um, or soup with lots of vegetables or beans is one of the best things that you can do for yourself at this time of year is to start to help us build up that extra layer that we need in the winter, stirring in a good amount of ghee or avocado oil or olive oil into your food. We need to have that lubrication because we're just coming off a very dry season. So we need to make sure we have that to keep our synovial fluid healthy, our joints healthy and not achy and stiff. You know, in the winter time, you can wake up with those cold, stiff joints and stuff. So we need to eat that oil and those foods that help to distribute the nutrients deep into our, well, we say we have seven layers of tissue. So having those healthy meals and we also, we don't want to forget fruit, but we don't want to eat, there's so much cold food in the summer, in the winter time, sorry. So making something like stewed apples or stewed pears or chopping up dates or figs and putting them into hot water uh, to give them, you may make, make like a little compote. It's, it's a little cinnamon, a little nutmeg, it's delicious. So getting in your fruit in the morning perhaps and then going for your larger meals throughout the day, but everything warm, everything cooked, sipping warm water throughout the day, and then we go to sleep earlier in the winter because it's darker sooner. We should go to sleep earlier. We should live with the seasons. So starting to wind down around six, seven, eight o'clock, no more food. <clears throat> if we eat food later in at night, it really disturbs our sleep. And wine, as you mentioned, just turns into sugar. And that 
really messes up your sleep when the alcohol burns off and you're just left with this burst of sugar, you're going to wake up and it's not great for you. Um, so th those are different. Those are some ways that we can use our food to transition. And as I mentioned, Abhyanga, which is doing the body oiling, um, is something that we really want to do in the winter time again, to keep us, to keep everything lubricated, to keep the joints loose and moving. Are there any good um, scents that you would recommend when you're doing body oiling? Well, we use Ayurvedic oils that are are, are um, steeped in herbs. So they either smell like sesame seed oil or the oil that they're in. So it's not really, it's not really an essential oil or an aromatherapy practice. But good winter grounding oils to keep us um, grounded in the wintertime, things like sandalwood, patchouli, vanilla, vetiver. These are things that help to align us with the season. But of course, if you get too grounded, you might want to use something like cinnamon or clove, something or floral or citrus scents to lift you up a little bit. So you really have to see where you are. Are you getting stuck and stagnant in the winter? Do you need something to lift you up? Or are you still going crazy and running around and forgetting to dress properly? So we need to look at what's going on with you in order to balance you well. Well, Susan, thank you so much for talking with me today and giving me a rundown um, from your books. And then also I wanted to end on, if you could just maybe tell us a few sentences about why you're excited for your next book and when that's coming out. Oh, great. Yeah. So it's, um, Ayurveda home remedies. It's, um, I think it's ancient wisdom for modern times. Oh my God. I can't remember the name of my new book, <laughs> but yeah, I remember. it's something, it's something like that. I know there's some subtitles are so long. Um, so that's going to come out in the spring of 2023 and it's, so it's filled with uh, common ailments and the Ayurvedic home remedies that you can do to prevent them, as well as to help remediate and to get rid of uh, the problems that are that you're having. So it goes from like, you know, how to get a good night's sleep to how to get rid of seasonal allergies to dealing with um, heartburn, constipation or diarrhea, foot fungus. I mean, I go I go from the top of the head, the different types of headaches, vata and pitta and kapha have different types of headaches. So how to treat those skin care, because skin is our, the largest organ on our body. And the skin has as a microbiome. So how each dosha takes care of their skin and then moving into the lungs and the guts and the stomach and the muscles and the joints and the feet, you know, how Ayurveda has been treating these ailments. But I have to say, I, I do bring in some Western medicine and because it's all integrative, if things get, if something gets too ingrained, let's say you have a, a bladder infection or a yeast infection, and it's been going on too long there's probably not like a home remedy that you can do to get rid of it hundred percent. You might need to take antibiotics. If you get a sinus infection, you might need to take antibiotics if you didn't treat it right away. But then Ayurveda steps in and says, how do I support it? What are the probiotic food and the prebiotic foods? And how, how can I support that Western treatment so it doesn't wipe out all of my good bacteria? You know, so it gives you a lot of different ways that you can continue to use Western medicine and bring in Eastern medicine as well and have it be complementary, prevention, longevity, and also how to bring these treatments to people who can't like typically afford it. Some of these things are crazy. You can't ask people to go to India and get treatments or go to the, you know, some fancy spa. How can we help other people in our community to maximize their health and boost their immune systems? And so I, I do end the book in that way. I got really like passionate about it. I was like, wait a minute, somebody who's got like five kids and works three jobs is not going to be rubbing oil on her body every morning. How can we help her out? And so there's are, there are different ways that we can um, offer support and help other people and that they can find ways into Ayurveda, find a path in that is right for where they are at this time. So that's all in the new book. Well, maybe I can coerce you into coming back and talking about it in the spring when it comes out. Um, and I'll let you know, I'll try some of this seasonal self-care um ideas that you've um outlined in the book and see we can check in to see how it's going but thank you so much. oh I would love to I, and you're, also really, you're so fabulous <laughs> really expanding sort of I, I mean expanding like my idea I my ideas and and um the possibilities the healing possibilities outside of um not not to like 
take away from anything, but sort of have hold both, um, which I feel like you do really, really, really beautifully. So thank you again for oh. all your effort and taking time to talk to me today. Take oh, thank you so much for inviting me. You're absolutely amazing. I love reading your work and looking at your books and it's such a huge honor to be with you. I want to have you on a podcast so I can ask you a million questions oh. <laughs> because you're incredible, Carissa. So thank you so much for taking an interest in my work. I really appreciate it. It was natural. I didn't, it wasn't like a, it wasn't, it wasn't a premeditated thing. It was like, a, um, it's, it's, very helpful and very lovely. And, and thank you. Beautiful. Thank okay. you so much. Bye. Bye.